Welcome all of you to this live program. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Jan Pretel from Miami, Florida, United States. Dr. Pretel is a musculoskeletal oncology surgeon and the chief of musculoskeletal oncology surgery at the Miami Cancer Center Institute. He's also a clinical professor of orthopedics at the Herbert Bertine College of Medicine associated with the Florida International University. Prior to joining Miami Cancer Institute in 2022, Dr. Pretel worked as the University of Miami where he was an associate professor of orthopedics and faculty of orthopedic surgery residency program and MSK Oncology Fellowship. He was also the director of clinical research in the Division of Musculoskeletal Oncology Surgery. Dr. Pradal's research has been published in high impact national and international orthopedic and oncology journals. He's been a speaker in national and international meetings and faculty for international musculoskeletal oncology courses. He's an active member of the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society and also a fellow of the AOS. He's also a diplomat of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Jan Predel from Miami, Florida, United States. Over to Dr. Predel. No, thank you. Thank you, Professor Gopalan, for this opportunity and for inviting me to talk about a topic that really is, is one of my uh, line of research. And I'm, I'm very interested on this, uh, on this topic. Um, so we're going to talk about um, the unplanned excision of soft tissue sarcomas. Um, I, I have no disclosures. So this is um, this patient is um, actually is, is a patient I saw when I was doing my fellowship a few years ago, and, and this 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 patient was the one that triggered my interest in in this in this topic. This is a fifty eight year old male that. I was working with uh, lifting heavy heavy batteries, and after that, he saw swelling on his on his right arm, for which he went to the ER and he was diagnosed initially as a rupture of the distal uh, biceps uh, tendon. Um, he then was referred to an orthopedic uh, surgery from the community, and he also had that CT that we can see on the right on the right hand side. Uh, this was interpreted as well as. Um, rupture of the distal uh, tendon, uh, biceps tendon with a huge uh, hematoma. So, so the, the, the surgeon proceed to do a drainage of, of the hematoma. And, and of course, you know, this, this was a, a soft tissue sarcoma. So he was referred to us and, and you can see, you can see all, all the things that, that were done uh, in this case. Uh, there was a huge, you know, hematoma here uh, also, you can see there uh, the exit of the of the drain that was placed that was not in line with the surgical uh, incision. Also, you can see the the white uh, stitches that that were that were um, that were used. Uh, so, and and of course in the CT you can see that um, that big soft soft tissue mass that was interpreted as a, as a hematoma. So not. We can only see, you know, we can only say on this case, you know, oh my God, you know, what what was done on this on this patient. Uh, so, the term of an unplanned total excision was described uh, first by Giuliano and Elber in 1985. Uh, the, the definition is a tumor resection without preoperative diagnostic modalities, without the intent to achieve uh, tumor-free margins. Uh, the problem is that soft tissue sarcomas are very rare and, and suspected, so inadequate or inappropriate evaluation and treatment is common. And usually the surgeons that are involved are plastic surgeons, general surgeons, and orthopedic surgeons. Several studies uh, reported that unplanned excision of soft tissue sarcoma represent about 18 to 66% of new patients referred to sarcoma centers. Uh, this is another example of a, a 60-year-old male that was referred to me with a left uh, growing soft tissue mass on the wrist. And this was read, uh, in this case, he had an MRI done, and this was read by the radiologist as a schwannoma. And the uh, hand surgeon that uh, took care of this patient uh, accepted, you know, the, the reading and went uh, went ahead and, and did uh, the resection. You can see at the end, uh, this was diagnosed as a mix of fibro uh, sarcoma. Uh, and, and this is this this picture actually are from the hand surgeon uh, that he, he took and then he sent it to me. Uh, and this is important part of the workup that we have to do in this in these patients to have a better idea of what you know potential tissues 
uh, were contaminated. So whenever it's possible, always ask, you know, for pictures or anything that the other that referring uh, physician can can give you. So, um, in order to avoid this this unplanned excision, we have to see we have to know how, how to approach patients with soft tissues um, masses. Um, the most the most errors in the early management of these uh, soft tissue sarcomas occur because the 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 sarcomas are unsuspected and inappropriately treated. So, all soft tissue masses should be approached with cautions, and initial assessment should begin with a comprehensive uh, HMP. Uh, in the history, we have to see uh, that usually, you know, soft tissue sarcomas are painless masses um, that rarely present with systemic symptoms, are rapid tumor growth, you know, that suggests malignancy. And also we have to ask about any uh, exposure to industrial chemicals, such as uh, phenoxy acid, um, chlorophenols, uh, dioxin or ionizing uh, radiation. Some clinical features that we have to keep in mind are the size, more than five, and rapid growth. And also in patients that have uh, smaller tumors, less than five centimeters, but that are adherent to the fascia or surrounding structures. And also we have to look um, if there is a compromise of regional lymph nodes, uh, because as we know, there are some soft tissue sarcomas that can have lymph node involvement. Uh, regarding the imaging studies, it's important to start always with a biplanar um, radiograph uh, to see if there is any osseous matrix, like for example, in extra, extra skeletal osteosarcomas, calcification, for example, physonoral sarcomas, bone invasions, and periosteal reaction. Also, the CT, it's a good complement uh, to plain radiograph to see extent of cortical destruction. Ultrasound is a cost-effective and can identify features such as size, location, depth, or presence of a hyperemic vascular or Doppler. And the MRI is really the gold standard, right? Um, and this is used to assess the size, depth, a relationship to neurovascular structures. Heterogeneity is a common feature uh, that can be observed in, in, in malignant tumors, but also in some benign tumors. Necrosis is highly suspicious for malignancy. Gadolinium enhancement improves diagnostic accuracy. Uh, the MRI provides excellent anatomical details that facilitates biopsy and surgical planning. And uh, the MRI should be performed prior to biopsy to avoid misinterpretation of related signal changes in the adjacent tissue. This is more um, related to cases when we do open biopsies. Uh, maybe with corneal biopsies that now is kind of the gold standard uh, for the biopsy, this problem is not such uh, significant. So here we can see some some examples. Uh, in the first, in this in this case, a soft tissue mass on the distal medial uh, thigh, which is very suggestive of a sarcoma. This some um, calcification, some sarcoma. The ultrasound that we were um, describing with the Doppler hypervascularity and the MRI with the characteristics that we define. However, also we can see some benign, you know, benign tumors like in this lipomatous mass, where we can see that the um, uh, the mass uh, follows the signal of, of of fat in the in the MRI. Um, these are some uh, surgical principles that we all know uh, about how to do biopsies. Um, usually, this is more, you know, related to open biopsies. Uh, now that you know, so uh, corneal biopsies are, are are done more more frequently. Um, this is less 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 important. However, when we when we do an open biopsy, we, we should uh, stick to these uh, to these principles. Uh, so, in general, when we have a soft tissue mass. We, we have to start with a complete history and physical, and then depending on the characteristics that we have, we have been uh, describing before, we have to go either with an MRI with and without contrast to have a better uh, information of the char characteristic of the mass. And then there is, if there is a still suspicious for a soft tissue sarcoma, we have to refer these patients to a sarcoma center. And, and let's, let's try the biopsy to be done by the uh, sarcoma surgeon. If the soft tissue mass is less than five centimeters, superficial to fascia and mobile, and very important, if it's stable in size, we can be less, less concerned about having a soft tissue sarcoma. And maybe in these cases, we can do serial examinations every three to six months, either clinical with ultrasound and or an, an MRI. Uh, so what what can we do if we if we you know have a referral of a patient with all these characteristics right uh, patient with excisions and then 
uh, having you know drains outside the uh, surgical surgical line or transverse uh, uh, transverse incisions, open wounds, etc. So when we have this this patient, we have to think about you know what's the profile, what's the profile of of patients that undergo unplanned excisions. The age usually will be the same as planned excisions because is is when the the sarcoma sarcoma appears. Uh, this is important. There is a history of trauma that can be up to in sixty five percent of patients. So it's very easy that uh, pro uh, physicians that are not used to um, treat uh, sarcoma patients be very confused and they will think that this might be a hematoma. Uh, regarding the size, usually implant excisions is more likely to occur in patients that have smaller tumors, uh, less than five centimeters when compared to plant excisions. And in regarding the location, as it was described in Nakamura in uh, 2022, usually implant excisions are more frequently associated with males with a smaller tumor, superficial and located in the trunk. Um, in most cases, um, it will be superficial tumors. Um, and the misdiagnosis that usually are done are when there are superficial tumors, usually a physician thinks that these are lipomas. And when there are deep tumors, usually are a physician thinks these are hematomas. And with um, if we add, you know, this past history that's up to 65% will uh, express that they had a, a trauma, then you know it's more likely that uh, that uh, errors will be will be made. The most common pathologic uh, diagnosis uh, it will vary depending on the um, different um, series that are published. Um, in this case, you know cyanosarcoma, uh, UPS, liposarcoma. In our in our experience, uh, we published uh, a paper in two thousand twenty one. And we found that in the group of unplanned excisions, myxofarosarcoma was the most common, which um, also um, it's in the same line as uh, Takemori uh, et al. that also found that in the unplanned excision group, up to 25% will be myxofarosarcomas. Um, now, how you classify these, these resections? Um, you can say that a patient underwent a total and plan excision, which is the most common thing. And in this case is when there is there was no preoperative diagnostic modalities performed or biopsies, etc. Usually these will be uh, tumors that are superficial and they are misdiagnosed as benign tumors, uh, usually as lipomas. Now, partial and plan excisions, uh, they will have preoperative imaging and or biopsies are performed, but they, they are either inadequate or they are misinterpreted not leading to inappropriate excision. Like in the case that I presented before with the soft tissue mass on the wrist that was misread as a schonoma and it turned to be a mix of fibrosarcoma. Now the MRI alone is the most common study performed in this uh, type of uh, partial and planned excisions. And it can be uh, uh, reported um, around 45% uh, of cases. So, when we have an unplanned excision of a soft tissue sarcoma, usually the way I like to approach these, these cases is by asking myself three questions. What was, on, what was done to the patient? What is going on with the tumor? And at the end, what should I do? So regarding the what was done to the patient, right? Um, the first thing is that these patients have to be managed in multidisciplinary sarcoma centers. The first thing that you have to do is try to put together, uh, as I say, the pieces of a puzzle, right? Because in this case, the patient come to you when the surgery was already done. So what you have to do is to go backwards, right? Trying to see what was done and trying to put the pieces together. So in order to do this, it's very important that we request uh, operative reports, right? To see what was done, what compartment was the, uh, was the uh, tumor located, if any other compartment were violated during the surgery, if there was any muscle, you know, like in the case that I presented first, where the F FCU was, you know, the deep margin of that uh, myxofarosarcoma. Uh, diagnostic imaging, if anything was done, or, you know, if we have an, at least an MRI, a CT, 
an ultrasound or nothing was done. Pathology reports, and also it's super important to ask for the histology slides because as it was reported by uh, Randall et al. Um, in 2004, uh, up to 37% of histologic diagnosis can be incorrect when they are done outside the sarcoma center. So it's super important for your MSK pathology to review these slides because in many cases, the diagnosis can change. And also it's important to uh, request any information about any previous adjuvant uh, treatments. So then we have to see, you know, um, how was the surgical, how, how the surgical side looks. Uh, the skin incisions, right? Uh, it's very common that transverse or oblique incisions are done, and that this will end on having larger resection areas, compromised lymph function, maybe the, the use of muscle flaps or a skin graft for coverage, and also a wider radi uh, radiotherapy fields. Also, we have to see if there is presence of hematoma because there is a theoric, uh, theory, theoretical risk of tumor cells contaminating beyond initial tumor boundaries, the use of drains, uh, since drains away from the incision can cause more extensive substantial contaminations and finally a wider uh, surgical resection. Also how the skin closure was done, if it was left, left open, uh, like in this case on the left-hand side, if, um, uh, if, there, if the stitches that were used is uh, wider, so we have to do a, a, a bigger section of um, of skin. And also, you know, if, if there was a closure by, by layers, because that can give us an idea if the compartment was um, respected or there's a violation of um, uh, surrounding compartments. Now, this is the question that we have to do on regarding what was done to the patient. Now, what is going on with the tomb, right? And, and this is basically what we call the staging of the tomb. And we can have a local staging or a distant staging. Local staging basically is where the surgical, uh, where the surgery was done. And you, we usually use an MRI. And for the distant staging, depending on the tumor, usually we do a CT uh, either of the chest abdomen pelvis, depending on, you know, the type of, of, of sarcoma that we are, we are dealing with. Now, here we can see two examples, right, of an MRI. Uh, in the left-hand side, a pleomorphic mix of sarcoma, post implant excision with residual tumor. And in the other side, uh, same thing, pleomorphic mix of sarcoma, but without an obvious you know, residual tumor. So we can see how different MRIs can look and how difficult it will really uh, to plan, you know, the resection that we have that we have to do. So there has been, you know, several studies regarding MRI, how, how useful they are, they are to assess the residual tumor. And as and, and you can see, you know, the sensitivity in all these um, studies really go down, you know, around to 64, 75%, uh, even, you know, 65.9%. So we can see um, that really, you know, uh, undergoing implant excision complicates, you know, the evaluation and assessment of the surgical bed and how much tumor potentially was um, was left, uh, left behind. Um, and usually this sensitivity even drops more if there is no obvious uh, residual tumor. So these sensitivities are still in that in that uh, percentage because they're usually macroscopic, you know, residual tumor. And usually what they what they say is that uh, you will see a nodular nodular enhancement um, finding. So when we have an idea of what was done to the patient um, and what's going on with the tumor, uh, then we can start thinking about what treatment should we offer the, offer the patient? And regarding the treatment, there are basically three treatment modalities. Surgery, uh, that we call tumor bed excision, radiation, and chemotherapy. The tumor bed excision, the goal is to remove residual tumor, either macroscopic or microscopic, and the potentially contaminated tissues with negative margins. Now, the rationale for this procedure is based on the observation that gross and microscopic residual disease is often present following implant excisions, which has a pronostic implication. 
Here we can see uh, a table from our uh, current concept that we published in 2015, where we gather different, um, different studies that were published up to that time. And we can see that there is a residual disease percentage uh, very high, up to 72%. And we can see also the correlation of this with a local recurrence rate, which if, the, if there is no uh, residual disease, will be much lower than if there is residual disease. So based on this, there are basically two approaches that the different sarcoma groups have uh, reported at this point. Um, there is a group from, as we can see here, these two articles, a group from France and from Italy, where they, they say, okay, we can do a watch and wait approach, meaning you see, you know, the, you don't do a tumor bed excision and you see, you know, if there is a recurrence, a recurrence or not. Um, however, the the tendency, the, the current tendency to with these patients is to do a tumor bed excision. And, and why? Because there is evidence, you know, some evidence that not doing it can have a negative impact on the oncological outcomes of these patients. And here we can see uh, the, the study by Nakamura uh, that published in 2022, where they find that uh, after univariate analysis, there is an association between tumor bed excision and local control, uh, even in, pa in patients with small, small tumors. Uh, and that the five year local recurrence uh, free survival was better with a tumor bed excision than without tumor bed excision. Um, also, uh, Mori in 2008, after uh, multivariate analysis showed that tumor bed excision was also an independent uh, predictor for local control. And this is a very interesting uh, study by Sang uh, uh, et al. that was published this year, where we can see that the local recurrence group will have much worse oncological outcomes than um, if there is no residual tumor or if there is residual tumor. So, you know, in this case, um, waiting, you know, for having a recurrence may potentially jeopardize the uh, oncological outcome of, of these patients. So the, the purpose and, and, and the objective of a tumor bed excision will be to resect all the prior operative incision to include of adjacent cuff of skin, soft tissue based on operative reports, pathology reports, physical exam and MRI. And this is what I was talking about, putting together the pieces of the puzzle, right? Having as much information as possible so you can really plan how much do you have to, to resect on these patients. And also keep in mind that adequate surgical resection is difficult to assess, right? Due to presence of scar tissue, loss of normal anatomical planes and lack of papal mass. However, um, in our experience, uh, we do believe that uh, doing intraoperative assessment in these cases is still useful as we, um, we show here uh, in our experience that we published in 2021. And we can see that uh, there was uh, the accuracy of intraoperative pathologic assessment between unplanned and uh, planned excisions was very similar. And it was useful to have this um, uh, intraoperative assessment because there were cases in which uh, repeat intraoperative pathological assessment uh, uh, end up in subsequent uh, re-resections you know, during the same uh, surgical, surgical time uh, due to microscopic positive uh, margins. And this was uh, much higher in unplanned excisions uh, than planned excision with an old ratio of 3.2. So in this patient, in these patients still, I think um, it's useful to, to do an intraoperative assessment. Uh, and basically when there is residual macroscopic uh, disease, uh, because it can help you to at least save, you know, an additional surgery uh, to the patient. Now, another question is when to perform these uh, tumor bed excisions. Um, there is very little data on this. There is only one study by Han in 2011, and they didn't really find um, a difference um, uh, in between uh, 
uh, having uh, early or late uh, uh, tumor bed excision with local recurrence very, very similar. And this is this is really the, the question of the million dollars, right? How, how much do we have to resect? And here, as you as you can see on this uh, right hand side, uh, if you go to surgery.com, really uh, we have to go to to the uh, to the uh, item and click. Are you totally lost, right? Because uh, really it's very difficult to assess to assess this, um, and there is no really an idea resection margin. Uh, the only thing that we that we know is that these surgical resections. Uh, need to be more extensive due to potential contamination of adjacent tissues. Um, there is a, a morbidity associated to tumor bed excisions. Uh, there are several studies that uh, have shown that uh, there is an increased risk for using flaps or skin graft reconstructions. Um, and also uh, here we can see that uh, to Tokumoto um, et al. Uh, also reported that uh, reconstruction rate and size of the skin defects in unplanned excision was significantly higher and larger than when doing a planned excision. And the skin defects were 1.9 times larger after unplanned excision than uh, planned uh, than plan excisions. Um, but also when we are dealing with this uh, uh, patients that underwent unplanned excisions, and uh, not only the morbidity, uh, the surgical morbidity is, is an important um, factor that, ha that that we have to keep in mind, but also this patient will have uh, increased costs in their in their care, right? As it was reported by Moratel um, in 2020, and we can see that unplanned excision cost of management was 64 percent higher than planned excision cases. And even the hospital stay was longer after unplanned excisions, right? So um, this is more or less what we have now of evidence related to the tumor bed excision and the surgical management of these, of these patients. Uh, as I said before, the other two modalities that are used to uh, treat these patients are radiation and chemotherapy. And um, regarding the radiation, uh, its role is not well defined for these patients. Um, Kepta et al. Uh, in 2005 uh, reviewed 78 patients and reported a local failure after radiation in only 12% 12, 12 of cases. However, there are some authors that have not found uh, uh, protection against local recurrence in these unplanned un excisions. Uh, such as Potter, Lean, or Manoso. Uh, this is a case in which a 69-year-old female with implant excision of pleomorphic mixofibrosarcoma and there were tumor bed excision and brachytherapy. And two years later, there was a uh, local recurrence. Um, so nowadays, uh, there is a more tendency to go and do preoperative radiation and then the tumor bed, uh, tumor bed excision. Uh, in these in these cases, uh, there is some literature uh, supporting good results, like uh, Jones uh, et al. in 2016. And you can see that there is a five-year local uh, control, 95%, a five-year local recurrence, free survival, 86% and a five-year overall survival of 94%. Um, however, uh, when using radiation, preoperative radiation, as in the patients that undergo uh, planned excision of substitute sarcomas, we have to know that the perioperative morbidity is high and it can go, in this case, in this uh, study, was we'll reported up to 25% of, of patients. Um, in another another study, more, more recent study from this year that was published in Oncologist, um, Alignet et al. found that a 10-year local recurrence rate was much lower in the in the group with radiation, and that ten year local recur uh, local recurrence free survival was much higher also in the uh, group with uh, that undergone radiation. Um, now there will be some patients where, based on the location of the tumor, 
the medical condition of the patient, etc., there will not be good candidates for surgery. So in these cases, we can maybe try only to um, uh, treat them with radiation. And in this um, study from the Mass General Group from 2005, they, they found that uh, in patients that undergo underwent only radiation without re-excision, they had a local uh, control rate up, uh, at five years up to 88%. Um, and the local recurrence free survival, as well as the distal metastasis free survival, uh, was basically affected by the depth of the tumor and the tumor size, right? So basically, it's more related to that uh, to the tumor characteristics rather than the procedure that uh, that was done. Uh, now, chemotherapy, chemotherapy, the role of chemotherapy. It's not well established yet. Um, this is very depending on the sarcoma center. Um, usually, um, this is recommended in patients with metata metastatic disease at presentation or individuals with high-grade risk for metastatic disease, stage three. Um, the regimens based are on doxorubicin or ifothamide. And um, the use of chemotherapy has not been studied in a prospective fashion in patients that under, undergo uh, unplanned excisions. So really, when we have a patient with an unplanned excision and we are thinking about using chemotherapy, we uh, we take the characteristics of the patient before you know the, the unplanned excisions. Uh, like for example, if a patient had a tumor that was more than five centimeters deep, high grade, before the implant excision, then we take these those characteristics to recommend you know chemotherapy um, in that in that example. Now, to finish this up, what about prognosis? Um, and this is the main the main problem uh, when we're talking about implant excisions of, of sarcomas. Um, what we have seen, and this is this is a, a systematic review and meta analysis that we have. Uh, submitted to 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 core. This is uh, under review. Uh, this is a, a a big systematic review that we have included more than fifteen thousand patients undergoing plan excisions and more than five thousand patients undergoing unplanned excisions. Um, and we have found that the five year local recurrence uh, free survival is uh, affected or you know by unplanned excisions. Um, also, an important thing is that the five-year five-year overall survival, we didn't find any uh, negative impact of the implant excision, and I think um, there is only one one study from a uh, big study from uh, from Toronto from a Toronto group um, that they found that there was some uh, negative impact uh, on the overall survival, or, but. What we what we think is that the overall survival in these patients really depends on the characteristic of the tumor, meaning if it's high grade, if if, if a large tumor, etc. Those characteristics will really give the overall survival impact on the patient rather than the unplanned excision itself. Um, also, we have uh, we found that residual disease um, will affect. Uh, negatively, the five-year local recurring free survival, as it was, as it has been described uh, previously, and uh, this is something important that we found is that the five-year over five-year overall survival in cases where there is recurrence also will be negatively impacted with um, a risk rate a risk ratio of one point eighty two. So this um, finding uh, with the finding from the study from Sang et al. that was published this year that I previously presented uh, challenges, you know, the approach of the, uh, of the wait and see, you know, approach that uh, other, you know, sarcoma centers um, may have. Um, you know, uh, finally, um, based on the morbidity of this uh, of this procedure, uh, it has been um, described uh, previously 
that uh, the amputation rate might be higher in unplanned excisions. Uh, however, uh, we were not able to find that in our systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, so I would say that usually these uh, patients with unplanned excision, they will undergo more morbid procedures, but not necessarily will have a higher amputation rate. So as conclusions, uh, unplanned excision of substitute sarcoma is a relevant problem for orthopedic oncologists representing a significant number of new patients' referrals. The best way to approach this problem is prevention through education. Tumor bed excision is still the standard of care, or at least what most of sur or surgeons do to treat this problem, but the watch and see approach has been described. Radiation therapy seems to be helpful in local control. Chemotherapy use is based on guidelines for soft tissue sarcoma treatments, and the oncological outcome affected are mainly local recurrence and five years local recurrence free survival. Overall survival and distant metastasis free survivals seems to be more dependent on the nature of the primary tumor rather than the unplanned excision procedure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pretel, for this comprehensive presentation. Dr. Pretel, you can stop sharing actually. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pretel, for this comprehensive presentation. Interestingly, I've hosted uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar. You mentioned in one of the papers uh, who published in the JBC American, we discussed something, not exactly the same topic, something similar. Uh, Dr. Pretel, let's have a short uh, Q&A. Sure. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Pretel, how to avoid an unplanned excision is what you're trying to convey, right? So that's what you have done on your papers and your research. So one needs to have a strong suspicion that it's going to be a soft tissue sarcoma. And one of the criteria that you mentioned, and of course, everyone says the size, right? Uh, someone has said four centimeters, and now I think it's accepted as five centimeters. And uh, yeah, in contrast with GI surgery, where we have a tumor markers available in orthopedics and soft tissue oncology, do we have similar tumor markers? Well, I mean... Um... So you, you mean two more markers to see if there is... Um, There's a possibility a of... Yeah. No, the possibility or, of a sarcoma in the index surgery. Well, two more markers um, in the index... I mean, for the surgery itself, there is not really two more, two more markers that you can do like immediately, right? Um, even for, you know, to assess metastatic disease, we already we don't have that like for carcinoma for example um so in reality it's, it's a lot of of clinical suspicions right uh for the index procedure and as i say as i tell my residents and, and fellows no I, I tell them look if a patient comes with a soft tissue mass if it's deep or superficial do some kind of imaging right and if it's not a lipoma then biopsy <laughs> You know, um, so it, it, it's like that. Um, you know, like Paul, I would say is something that you can easily, you know, uh, diagnose with an MRI, uh, soft tissue mass that follows all the all the fat sequences. But any other thing, I mean, if you are not really a, an expert uh, in interpreting, you know, MRIs or imaging studies, I would probably refer in doubt, refer right, uh, and refer to a sarcoma center. So people that have more experience can take care of the of the patient. And uh, Dr. Pretel, uh, suppose you have a lesion in the back. Say, suppose you have a lesion between the scapulae, okay, in the interscapular the area. Now, traditionally, we, we have been told that, okay, you have a lipoma or a similar lesion there, the chance of a sarcoma is going to be high. That was a traditional teaching. Do you think it still holds good? Uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, uh, I would say that probably... The location, that, the location. I mean. That location, that treat, you know, the traditional location, you know, to divide in axial and appendicular, right? Appendicular lower risk, axial more more risk. Um, I I think that maybe for some kind of tumors that might be still you know um, uh, valid, uh, and and mainly probably for bone tumors, you no. Know? 
um, for example, chondrosarcoma, right? Like uh, if you have a, for a secondary chondrosarcoma, you have a osteochondroma, axial, or, you know, maybe this can transform into higher risk of, of transforming. No? Uh, for soft tissue sarcomas, uh, probably I won't say that that's necessarily the, 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 the case. Uh, I would say more is based on size, no, rather than, than location. Now, there are some locations that are more suggestive of sarcomas, right? Uh, for example, the distal thigh, distal medial thigh, right? A distal medial thigh right. mass is, you know, sarcoma. It's, it's from Hamilton Bailey. I remember in Hamilton Bailey, those are the, those are the few locations that were mentioned long. I mean, exactly. days ago, we used uh, to learn that. Exactly. The other thing is, for example, an M MRI, right? On an MRI, intermuscular, intermuscular location, right? It's highly suspicious maybe for a mixed soil liposarcoma, right? Uh, not in the muscle, no, over the muscle, intermuscular, right? So that's another kind of suspicious thing. Uh, so there, you know, there are some, some things that when, when you have certain experience seeing these patients, you can start thinking, oh, you know, this may be, may be a sarcoma. We have to, we have to be, be more careful, no? But, but usually, you know, these implant excisions are made by people that are not sarcoma surgeons. So, uh, so I would say, and, 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 and on summary of this, you know, is if you have a mass that, that you are in doubt, refer it, you know, don't do more. I mean, because if you try to do more, uh, then you might end up uh, making a mistake. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pratil. Uh, Pratil, you also published on benign tumors in children, right? I think I've seen a paper from your side on benign tumors. Now, very commonly, we see a unicameral bone cyst in a 13-year-old kid, and it comes with a pathological fracture. You see a fall fragment sign. Clinically, uh, imaging-wise, everything is in favor of a sultry or a unicameral bone cyst. In those situations, would you go a step ahead in getting a biopsy or you, would you like to treat it straight away? Because everything is classic. Because interestingly, I hosted a surgeon long ago and he said, in 99% your right is going to be a unicameral or a simple bone cyst, but there's a 1% chance there's going to be a sarcoma. So do a biopsy first. Yeah, so so I mean, I, I think in those cases, you can, you can have two approaches, right? Um, one approach is, as, as that surgeon said, you know, I mean, if you have a 1% doubt, do a biopsy. I mean, it's not going to harm really, right? Um, but also you have to keep in mind the, the culture, the thinking of the patient, or in this case, in case the parents, right? Um, and you have to, you know, take that into consideration. There are some parents that they don't want to have invasive procedures, you know, in, 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 if it's not needed, right? Uh, there are other other parents that will say, no, you have to do it, you know, because they are super concerned, etc. So you can have either a more invasive procedure like uh, approach, like doing a biopsy, or you can also say, okay, let's do a very close follow-up, you know, clinical follow-up. Because in that case, where you have a 99%, you know, uh, chance that it's a benign, benign tumor, then you will say, eh, it's not going to be harmful, you know, to do maybe a six-week follow-up, Right or a three months follow up where you can say, okay, if this is something bad, it's not so bad that it will grow too much that I will be out of the window of treatment of this patient, right? So I, I think that both both approaches can be valid um, depending on how certain you are that this is something benign, you know? Thank you, Dr. Pretel. Dr. Pretel, one last question before we wind up the session. Now, I, check, I checked one of your papers that you published in JBG's American, exactly, in 2015, right? Unplanned, unplanned yeah, exit. Yeah, the I think the, yeah, the message that you gave was education. Ultimately, it's the education of those who treat them primarily. Those primary care providers, that's important, isn't it? Yes. Yes, I think that um, the best way to, to avoid... Uh, the the best way to treat an implant excision is not to do it, <laughs> right? Um, and that is based on education. Um, uh, education is is uh, the cornerstone of this. Now, it's difficult, right? Because you cannot be educating 
all the providers you know in the world you know that that will be dealing with so that's patient. what we are doing with this program <laughs> exactly for well, that and that and that's why i accepted this invitation because i i, I think this this is the way you know to go and have um uh you know to be to be heard right to be listened uh because uh, in my presentation you know i i, I put that you know is plastic surgeon general surgeon orthopedic surgeon but it can be any any provider and i have an anecdote you know with one of uh, one patient that i treated in the past that the surgeon so it was a soft tissue sarcoma in the posterior thigh okay and the surgeon that did this was an obgyn obgyn i mean you say it's a guy how an obgyn we would do in surgery on him right so it was a, a patient that went with a with a wife to the obgyn the wife, you know, start talking about, you know, her things. And then at the end, he said, oh, doctor, my husband has a bump on the thigh. And the, and the OBGYN said, oh, I can take care of that. <laughs> you know, so, and he took it. <laughs> and it was a sarcoma. So it's, you know, it's a matter not only of, you know, of, of knowing, you know, that a more than five centimeter mass, you know, could be a sarcoma. It's also for every professional, you know, to have an insight and say, okay, this is what I can do. This, this I don't have to, to do, you know what I mean? Like I, I have some limits, you know, and, and I, I think that is also an important, important thing that we, that we have to do when, when we are trying to avoid these unplanned excisions, huh? to create. Well, orthopedic surgeons generally have the God complex. We think that we are God. <laughs> we should, we should stop thinking that we are God, isn't it? <laughs> it's true um and and also you know um I, I mean i don't know i mean this is only a personal personal view no and maybe this is not happening in other parts of the world but sometimes you know the pressure of of of, of productivity doing surgeries right uh sometimes they it, it might be pushing some some indications no and 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 may and, and do some surgeons do things that they shouldn't shouldn't be doing right um, so we have to always think about the patient first, right? Patient is first, what is indicated for a patient. And if this is something that I'm not trained to do, don't do it. No, if there is, if it's a doubt, refer. Thank you, Dr. Pradil. Dr. Pradil, I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for this wonderful presentation and a no. clear, strong message for the entire orthopedic community. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity.